there's a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. This is a film about an extraordinary journey, a roller coaster ride of incredible challenges, heartbreaking lows, and dizzying highs. A journey which takes me through my worst nightmares. Henrietta Spink is the mother of two severely disabled children. She recorded her extraordinary life in an audio diary that preserved her sanity. January the 19th. I feel so lonely. If this were just for a week or a month or even a year, I could have courage. But it's not. I pray that God gives me strength. I've run out. Henry is a mystery. He shows no signs of brain damage yet cannot walk or talk. Freddie is autistic and has severe physical and learning difficulties. Had I known how we would not survive looking after two such disabled children, I would have switched his life support off. Henrietta's dream is that one day she will find a cure for Henry and a better life for Freddie. Her journey will take the family across the world in search of a miracle. And a drastic decision will change their lives forever. The pressures of continuing legal battles and caring for their boys is forcing husband Michael out of work. A, a very senior local council officer came to see us and he said, I have no moral or legal duty to keep you in work. When you're on benefits, then we'll help you. Henrietta and Michael are spiralling into debt and on the verge of losing everything. That's ready to roll. OK, do you want to come and meet Henry then? In the wakes, it's about 4 this morning. You've been busy, haven't you? You've been very busy. You have to have a kiss. <laughs> what have you been doing? You've been bouncing. Wow. Give me a clever kiss. Go on, give me a kiss. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> Where are we going up this way? How nice to see you. Oh, it's nice to see you too. Caring for the boys is a full-time job, and it's taken years for the Spinks to get any help at all. They now have two carers for four hours a day. Henry is 17, Freddie 13. Both boys have very different and demanding problems. Freddie has a diaphragmatic hernia, which means that his stomach doesn't close properly. We had one operation a month for six months, and that meant theatre every single time as an emergency case. Um, and we never knew if he was actually going to come out of it alive. Now, do you want some toast? Henry is globally developmentally delayed, which means um, all over development is, well, non-existent really. He doesn't walk, doesn't talk. Um, he's an amazing character. He's very happy, but he does have his moods. It, it's relentless. It never stops. I think people get a snapshot into your life of me carrying Henry in and out of the car or carrying a wheelchair or something like that. And then they think it stops there but it doesn't. It's, you know, I feed Henry for three hours a day probably. I've changed 40,000 nappies. I've sat with Henry on the loo for an, an entire year. It's things like that. I mean, it's the milestones that people pass and they kind of, they love their children, but they're longing to not change a nappy and for their child to go to the loo by themselves or that kind of thing, or feed themselves. How was your day? Did you have a nice day? Yeah. What did you do? Did you do? Music. Lots of music. Was it nice? Yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> Henrietta makes time for fun and stimulating activities with the boys whenever she can. Both boys absolutely adore both the Science and Natural History Museum. They're both very visual and tactile. Um, and yeah, Freddie's got a favourite in the, in the basement. There's um, a sort of quite a younger children's section and it's got a bench that when if you sit on it, it farts. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I think with children like, like Henry and Freddie, it's so easy, particularly with a child like Henry, to leave them on the sidelines, sit them in a corner in a wheelchair and just say, that's their lot. And I don't. I really do believe that you need to uh, stimulate every aspect that you can. Henry takes my breath away with what he has to put up with um, and how tolerant he, he is and how tolerant he has been. Um, oh, I think to be disabled, you are so in the hands of others. And if those hands are not kind, what an awful world it is. I mean, it's, I could not have done his side of it, I don't think. Is that fun? <laughs> Your brother is so Henry was a honeymoon baby and came along... Nine months later. Nine months after we got married. And, yeah, he was a beautiful baby, really beautiful. I mean, the most beautiful baby. It was just so gorgeous. Mm. But he slept and he never woke up, not really for three years. I was worried after a few days and they kept saying to me, you know, he was a really lazy baby and, oh, don't worry, just tickle his feet kind of thing. But... I think there's some sort of nagging, nagging doubt. Um, you know, children start babbling at quite, a, at a quite a young age. There was no babble at all. He was very quiet. By six weeks, I was definitely thinking mm, something wrong. Twelve weeks. I mean, he'd passed all his checks, you know, and it was, these were medical people. These were people who saw babies every day. Um, but by 12 weeks, I met with my antenatal group. And the babies were so dramatically different. I mean, they were alive. They were awake. They were mini people. Um, they were really engaging and, and I just, my heart just froze. It was just, God, it was awful. I can't tell you. I just, I just knew at that moment. Perhaps it was meant. I don't know. Who knows? Who knows? And we had genetic counselling and they said, no, 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 you know, it's, um, it's just bad luck. It's a one-off. Um, and then we got pregnant. I got pregnant again with Freddie and I had 20 scans. I was really nervous. You know, I was nervous it was going to die. I was nervous it was going to have a brain tumour. I was nervous it was going to be another Henry. And it was just staggering when he was born. And I could hear the paediatrician saying, breathe, come on, breathe. He wouldn't colour up. They were trying to colour him up. And, and, he, and I he just wouldn't. knew. I knew. I thought, oh, my mm. God, I've no, gone to full term. No and problem. It was like my life was being taken away. I just, it was just unbelievable. And then they whipped him off into neonatal intensive care. And his heart was pushed off. I mean, the whole thing was a mess. His heart mess. was on the wrong side. <coughs> spleen was wedged up under his collarbone. I mean, there was nothing below his abdomen. And they kept saying on the scans, oh, he's thin. You would have thought they'd missed, you know, the fact that all of this bit of his body was missing, that they would have noticed. Um, and the only thing I could do was hide. Um, Socially. I, al I also couldn't bear the look in other people's eyes. Um, there was such pity, and I just, I couldn't hang in there if, if people... You didn't want it, in a way, not pity. I mean, I mean one of the with, with hindsight, I, I love Freddie, and I think he's the most talented boy in the world. I mean, I really love him. And, but had I known how we were going to be treated and how we would not survive looking after two such disabled children, I would have switched his life support off. I would have. I've got to counterbalance that because actually I don't fully agree with that. No, it's and a that's a clinical thing to say. I know it is and I couldn't. I mean, I wept. I prayed. I think I prayed literally every sort of... Mm. I, sp I lived in that chapel at St George's. So that was not what my heart said. But Can now I, I feel so angry. Sorry. Can I say something? Sorry. I mean, I mean basically, I, I, what I would say is, is that I don't fully agree with Henry on that. We've, we've been with the children and we haven't given up on them or given them up at all. T to some extent, it's a kind of thought at the back of one's mind in the sense that I think one often has devilish thoughts, but it's not a reality. No, it's not a reality, and I never even for a second wished it. I just, I wish I could have seen the future and I wish I could have been switched off. During these desperate times, Henrietta's diary became her closest companion. August the 10th, 2000. I feel so exhausted and demoralised. I spent last night sleeping on a horrible camp bed at St George's Hospital 
I can't bear the unknown factors of Freddy's operation. I live in dread. Are they going to call us up and say, sorry, he just died? I feel he's in borrowed time. June 2001. I don't hurt Henry by dreaming for him. Henry has no brain damage at all. It's just a question of finding the right scientist to unlock Henry. When we meet, I have no idea. I just know we will. October 17th. Suddenly Freddy decided to stagger across the room. His smile was the biggest I've ever seen. Henry, you're going to walk? In the early years, Henrietta and Michael paid for all the extra care the boys needed themselves. But as they grew bigger, so did their needs. Henry was 12, Freddie was 7, Freddie was beginning um, to grow and get larger and also he, he was having these um, serious throat problems as well and it got to a point where we simply were not able to manage in the sense that um, it, it was already a full-time job looking after them but then it became a full-time job for two people to look after them. Yeah. Running a marathon with you two. Yeah. And so at that point we turned to social services uh, properly for help although we'd approached them twice before right from the start they were giving us almost nothing and it was only by putting on extreme pressure all the way through that we were able to get it to a point where it became meaningful and that took literally years uh, to achieve. Among the many problems the Sphinx faced was Freddy's continual projectile vomiting. The washing machine was never empty. June the 5th. I can't cope with all the laundry. I'm doing six loads per day. My hands hurt so much. My electricity bill is astronomical. I need to use the dryer for everything, as we'd run out of clothes if I don't turn them round fast enough. The family turned to the council for help, explaining Freddie's condition. It was spectacular. Literally, this funnel of puke would come out 15 foot, and nobody believed it until they saw it. But we went through endless assessment, assessment after assessment after assessment, took about three months. And uh, they sent in um, somebody who, who said, yes, yes, we'll definitely, definitely help you. And oh, you know, I just left over the moon. And then we got a call. And they said, you can have eight hours help. And I thought, wow, I mean, that's amazing, eight hours help. You know, I mean, I, I did a lot of hours each day, but I thought eight hours, it's really going to help me out each week. It was a real silence down the other end. And she said, no, it's eight hours a year. And I thought, hmm. Freddie's vomiting was just one of the problems the Sphinx needed help with. Over the years, they found that getting any help from the authorities was an uphill battle. July the 16th, 2001. I fought tooth and nail to get a ramp put outside. It doesn't fit. I can't believe it. One's worth say Henry won't fit on the existing bus. I cannot and I will not send Henry to the wrong school. I feel so depressed. I want to curl into a ball and hibernate. When you have a disabled child, it doesn't come with a pamphlet saying your needs are the. You're just left in the dark. A visiting physiotherapist warned of the dangers of continuing to carry the boys. She recommended to the council and the Sphinx that they should have stair lifts. So I said, OK, so what happens now? So she went off uh, and said, well, I'm afraid to say I have to be assessed by an assessor from Wandsworth, somebody more senior, and that will take another three, four months. So duly four months passed by and the assessor of the assessor came back and watched the first girl do her assessment again. And then I said, great, so can we have the stair lifts now? And she said, no, I'm afraid my assessment now has to be assessed by Wandsworth's financial lot, and that can take up to two years. The council never provided stair lifts. They were donated by a well-wisher who had heard of their plight. But the Sphinx battles weren't to end there. Loads of people kept saying that you will only get help if you take your kids down to social services and dump them there. The Spink's constant daily grind in caring for their two severely disabled boys is made worse by having to fight for every bit of help they need. Relentless campaigns for carers, speech therapy, equipment, physio, transportation and schooling all took their toll. Over eight years, Henrietta poured her heart and soul into her audio diary. June the 5th, 1996. I'm only just discovering that there can be some help, but you must create a military campaign to get it. It was eight hours of help, wait for it, per year. I shouted at a manager in Wandsworth. 
No wonder they don't come back. I feel so worn out. Being so tired is making me rash. Michael is enraged. He's gone straight to Wandsworth Council. He's just rung me on the mobile to say he's going to get the budgets. They're public figures. I just don't know if I can be jolly anymore. I don't feel like I'm a good mother anymore either. My son is desperate to speak. He needs speech therapy. He deserves that, don't you think? We arrived at the appeal. I found I felt physically sick. I couldn't face sitting opposite the head. My heart was racing so fast. My other son is desperate to walk. Can he only have physio for 30 minutes per week? I feel so alone. I'm so afraid my child's future is in the hands of these people. It's about five in the morning. I can't sleep. I feel sick to the gut. Why is God allowing this to happen? We've lost. I feel empty. I'm desperate for help. I feel I'm going under. I feel so degraded having to beg and fight all the time. I need to get on with my life. Today, the Spinks continue their fight in the High Court. Their aim is to change the disability law, so a disabled child is assessed on their needs rather than the parent's ability to pay. The outcome could affect every family with disabled children in Britain. Their search to find a cure for Henry's mysterious illness and a better life for Freddie has interested neuroscientists in America. And Henrietta has written a book charting their struggles. Michael works as an art dealer, but holding down a full-time job and supporting the boys with the care they need is becoming impossible. A very senior local council officer came to see us, and I said to him, this can only end, at the end of the day, in financial disaster, because I know I'm taking too much time off to be with the boys to enable me, ultimately, to earn a proper living. And, and he said, I have no moral or legal duty to keep you in work. When you're on benefits, then we'll help you. And, and, and that was a deeply shocking thing to have said to you. Because at that point, you suddenly begin to have a feeling that actually you're in free fall. Michael has been forced out of work. The pressures are starting to mount. We've used up all our resources. I, I cashed in endowment policies. We were running up large credit card debts. Um, we remortgaged the house. It, it plateaued at a point that we simply couldn't handle it anymore. We're about 300,000 in debt now fr from caring for the boys. And there was no alternative. So the cost, 17 years down the line, has reduced us to having to sell the house. Feb 2nd, 2005. It's just the tiredness that's so difficult to deal with. It's also tough that none of our relatives, except Michael's mum, have anything to do with the boys. They run a mile. Off to Cornwall, thank God. A break from the battles with Wandsworth Council. It's half term. Tomorrow the Spinks are taking a break from London. It just seems it's so simple when you're packing for yourself. And with the boys, I mean, it's just so much clobber. But actually, I've cut it down a lot this time. Every move with Henry and Freddie is a major operation. Just packing and loading can be a full day's job. And with a mass of medication, nothing can be left behind. August the 10th, we're taking the boys off to our hideaway. Cornwall's been such a miracle come true for us. Here, 10 years ago, Henrietta had a vision that would change their lives. We were down here, and I suddenly said to Michael, I just had to say it, um, I said, look, I think we're going to win this money. Um, I don't know how or how much or anything like that. And um, I think it was a few months later, a, a football pools form dropped through the letterbox. Anyway, I took it upstairs, and I couldn't even understand how to fill out the form, so I had to ring, ring up to do it over the phone. I mean, can you believe it? And um, so I think I did, what is it, the minimum payment, six quid, one a week for six weeks or something, or 12 one, weeks. Yeah, one line. Or one line, just one line. And um, anyway, I filled it out. And then we were invited away. Then by... we, went, we went on a business trip. And remember, all this time, Henny had been going on a long time, um, saying that she was going to win the money, that, that this was going to happen. And the phone rang, and it was Angela on the phone, our nanny, and she said, she said, somebody from the football pools has come round to the house. Mm -hmm. And Michael, I remember, he went grey-white and sat down. Because they don't, they don't come round to your door for two and sixpence to come and tell you you've won a tenner. So we came back to London. Yeah, we literally, we got in the car. Came back to London, went to 
picked up the check, yeah. banked it. And drove to Cornwall. Came to Cornwall and then looked around over that Christmas break and found the house that we've got. And basically made an offer on it and... Moved in on a, Valentine's Day. A month after we made the offer, we were moving in, kitting it out and setting it up for the boys. And it was the beginning of a huge change for us. I don't actually have words to describe what it has meant to us. It's been a lifeline. A £350,000 win gave the Spinks family the retreat they needed. A lifesaver, perhaps even a marriage saver. Debt, exhaustion and council battles all put their strain on Michael and Henrietta's marriage, but their deep, loving connection held them together. Michael inspires me because he's so clever. Um, just my best friend. He's just my best friend. Always has been, always will be. I don't think either of us ever take that for granted. You can't. I mean, I've seen that in life. You can take nothing for granted. I think the thing with Henrietta is that it, she's a fount of energy that is always there, um, you know, moving on to the next thing, uh, never rolling over. And even when she has a very dark time, um, I know that she's going to come out of that and will be doubly energetic um, towards the children, uh, towards creating what she wants to create. She's a very, very creative person. Um, and it's very exciting being with her. The Spinks considered making Cornwall their permanent home, but the level of care available was insufficient to support their needs. For now, it remains a place to escape to. Quite often we get out of the car and he just hammers his way on the drums. And has to do. First thing he says is we're heading towards the house. We have a friend who's a professional musician playing a little bit for Freddie, which he does each time because Freddie loves it. And he was being a bit casual, and he suddenly found Freddie counting him in. We've got some very good friends down here, some lovely friends, and we've had a better social life in some ways down here than we've had in London. Where did I ever give him that idea? As you go past Exeter on the way down, you leave all the pressures of London behind you, the fights with Wandsworth. I can truly say that, that we never could have done the last seven years without this place. We don't think disability here, we don't... We just do, we just are, we're able to be. And that's an amazing gift. He can sit on a horse very yeah. happily, which is unusual. I mean, it's very strange that he can do that, but he just gets the rhythm of the horse and he can go along. Whereas, I, in no respect would I say that Freddie is athletic. Laughter and jokes, he, he really appreciates a good joke. He's got a tremendous laugh. He's the kind of boy who put the bucket of water over the door as the teacher walked through. You know, he's that, that sort of joke. If someone comes back to see him after two or three years, he'll, he'll get them to do the same, same old joke. He, he loves the old jokes, the best jokes. Henry, nice and warm in there, toasty. When I had Henry, I had a vision when he was born. I could just see him as a young man standing in a library. I could see what he was wearing, everything. Uh, it was really, really peculiar. I can't tell you, it was just so clear. I, I know today it still looks mad to anybody looking on the outside, but I can't change that. That's what's in me. That vision just stuck in my mind. Despite Henry's condition, doctors have never found any sign of brain damage. But Henrietta's vision that one day her search will discover the key to unlock Henry's brain has never faltered. As the holiday draws to an end, they receive news from scientists in America. May 2005. Jim Fallon has just emailed me to say he's found an unusually interesting feature in Henry's brain. Maybe the tide's turning. I hardly dare hope. Five more deep breaths. 
Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear mummy. Happy birthday to you. It's Henrietta's birthday. You wait, wait a minute. Do you want to After blow six out, mummy? Operations on his Can we blow it out together? You, you have my birth the candles. One, two, three, blow. I didn't lick them, Freddy. <laughs> There's also more hope for Freddy as doctors in America have agreed to run tests on both boys for free. Is that nice? If that's not a normal child, I don't know what it is. Their real interest lies in the causes behind Henry's mysterious illness, which is made more unbearable by his epileptic fits. At worst, it's 35 fits a day. At present, it's probably an average of five or six. But about three weeks ago, he had eight hours continuous convulsing where we ended up in hospital, and that was absolutely terrifying. We've consulted various doctors in this country, obviously huge, huge numbers of doctors in this country, and Henry more or less was written off from the age of three onwards because they couldn't understand what was wrong with him. Whereas um, the doctors we found in the United States were, are interested in Henry and are prepared to make investigations. It's in fact, we've gone down the scientist's route where um, Jim Fallon is actually a neuroanatomist and is a scientist rather than a doctor. Their fundraising appeal to fly the family and carers to America has resulted in an anonymous donor coming forward with ten thousand pounds. Henry Spink, tomorrow we're going to go to America. We are. We are. What do we want? What do we want? The Spinks are on their way. As usual, packing for both boys is a mammoth task. We've got the kit for California and we've got the kit for Boston. No, and there's 12 good. inches of snow in Boston and, and 75 70. degrees in California. Um, the boys use about, oh God, four, five, six nappies a day. Henrietta's investing a lot of hope in this trip. My dream is that Jim Fallon takes one look and he says, gee, it's not as complicated as I thought. We can fix this. And that's what I'm really, really hoping for. And everything in me says that it is something like that. I mean, you have to remember that Henry actually t does not have any brain damage. There's just a missing link somewhere. It's a, the first time this scan's been done on children. And so it's gonna be giving the scientists and the doctors a great deal of information, but for us it's very worrying and traumatic because both boys have got to have a general anaesthetic. The huge expectation loaded onto it because we're hoping that this will actually give us an idea of what we do next with the boys, mm. the treatment or an answer. And, and obviously until we've done that, we don't know whether it is or whether it isn't. So not only is it gonna be traumatic actually having the scans done, but the analysis of them as well is going to be uh, quite something. I hate the idea of um, just traumatising the children by giving them a general anaesthetic and all that goes with that. I mean, it's, it's really hard when you can't explain to them, you know, that it's for their benefit and it's really good and all the rest of it. Um, I mean, Freddie's got ideas of going to Disney, not to hospital. We haven't actually told him at all. He knows all about general anaesthetics and he's not going to be a happy bunny. No. The state-of-the-art three-dimensional brain scanner is here in Boston. The results will be taken out to pioneering neuroscientists in California. I've maxed out on the number of slices before right. the overload. Great, great. And each of these green slices here is going to represent a, a slice that we're going to acquire. So we're, going to we're hoping to get a number of different types of pictures to get a better idea of what are the structural differences between these two boys who have autism but are yet very different in terms of their ability to function. So what we're going to do is get one set of images called diffusion tensor images and that will give us an idea not just about volumes but what's the structure of the tissue in those volumes. The 3D scan the doctors are creating can deliver a detailed activity map of the brain's connections. See if we can keep going to get the whole brain coverage in this one. For Freddy, this could provide new insights into his autism. Well done, Freddy. You've been really good. He's getting there. Well, there's a couple of things we see in Frederick's brain. First of all, he has an old stroke in the deep part of his brain. He had a fairly traumatic delivery, so I presume it's related to that. It looks chronic, um, which means that there's more fluid there, and the brain substance uh, has decreased. There's less brain there. It's actually a cavity at this point in time. 
I'm hoping to learn exactly what's going on in Freddie's brain and also what the link is between the two boys. Um, but we've already just discovered one thing that stood out in this scan was that Freddie had a stroke at birth, which we were never ever told. Um, but apparently his brain has rewired itself around that. But still, it would have been quite nice to have known that earlier. With answers presenting themselves on Freddie's condition, the real hope now lies in exploring the mystery of Henry's disabilities. Awesome. You are such a superstar, just like your brother. Another 45 seconds. I'm going to be there. I'm going to be there when you wake up, OK? Excellent. Uh, I'm going to be there. OK. Can I just see that? OK. I will do something else. Excellent. Good boy. Good. Excellent. Good. Wonderful. Okay. Five more deep breaths. All right. I love you. What about the, yeah, we're going to remember the uh, image correction. Oh, yes, for the uh, 3D. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the think so. The Californian doctors believe there could be a blockage preventing Henry's brain giving his body instructions. If they can locate and bypass this, there could be an awakening for Henry. The big white matter model that communicates between the two hemispheres actually looks normal in him and better or bigger in size than his brother, which is interesting given that clinically he is one that's more affected. So it's interesting and looking again at this with a clinical eye, I'd be hard pressed to say that there's an abnormality here. So I would, um, would have called this one pretty much normal. She was surprised at how normal Henry's brain was. Mm. Which has always been one of the quirky things that, that Henry doesn't display any immediately obvious sign of why he is as he is. So in fact, the, the mystery has, if not deepened, has, has not solved at this point, you know, because... It will, uh, it will. Yeah, I, I, it will, but, but the quality of the information it. clearly was very good, which is fantastic. Yeah. I think some information will start to come out, which will give us an idea of maybe where to go and where what, what the next stage is. Yeah. And that's what we came for. In Los Angeles, armed with a boy's brain scans, the Sphinx are meeting Dr. Schenkel, a professor of cognitive sciences at UCI. So, one of the ideas was that maybe the connections to the, the surface of the brain, the cortex, didn't develop. Right. And um, recently there have been an explosion of technology for providing electrical therapy. Mm. Okay. In this case, they can sort of cr create a, a chip mm. that gets placed in a certain area mm -hmm. of the brain. And what they're finding is that the person can think, like move my left arm, mm. and their left arm moves. It's uh, stimulating a brain area that's been damaged. Right. And um, it's the kind of thing that might promote the development of a circuit as well as... But it kick-started so that the chip then became redundant after a certain point? It's, that's, that's, a that's a possibility. Right. The possibility of inserting a chip into Henry's brain takes the Spink family across town to Dr. Jim Fallon, a professor of neuroanatomy and biology at the University of Irvine. Millions of these pathways is set in parallel, but you don't have this fast tracking of information back and forth. It's Jim Fallon is one of the world's leading authorities on brain mapping. Uh, with these chips, having the, that ele those electrical pulses there at one end, and then hoping that a neural network is set up, well, in one sense, the stimulator is like a battery. In the other sense, you've got a motor at the other end. Now, you, both of those may be functioning, but unless you have the cables connecting the two, you will not have you know, the, uh, the appropriate effect. So part of the idea of doing the DTI and the reconstruction of the tracks is you want to make sure that cabling is there to carry out those functions. Well, the skull, we're Jim able Fallon must now analyze the results and check Henry's neurological pathways. And Henry's brain. Uh, without but it will be months before it will be known if there can be a cure for Henry. <laughs> Now for Freddie and Henry, well, it's time for the
With new medication prescribed for Freddy and research on the brain scans underway, there's hope in the air for the Sphinx. Almost so much information in the last few days, it's very difficult to actually assimilate it and put it together. Uh, not least because I think with a brain like Henry's, no one really knew quite whether it was capable of being turned back on again. It was extremely interesting seeing Dr Shankel. Um, he's the guy who prescribes the medication. But he felt with Henry um, that possibly this chip implant, uh, which is so revolutionary, I mean, it's literally just being done now, but that actually could alter it and really just rapidly switch Henry's brain on and bypass all the medication. Now the Sphinx must turn their thoughts to financial problems back home. They have been forced into selling their house and must now decide how they're going to survive. They are considering a drastic plan that will clear their debts but change their lives forever. Wow, that is amazing. Back from America, the Sphinx now face the reality of their debts. They remain certain that selling their home is their only option. There is nothing that I could have done differently. The only, the only thing I could have done differently, I suppose, was take the advice that several people, in fact, loads of people kept saying, that you will only get help if you take your kids down to social services and dump them there. And I couldn't do it, and I still can't do it. And I be, just, can you imagine? Be specific, when they say that, it means going down to the local council offices with Henry and Freddie, not just leaving two children, with our boys, Henry and Freddie, taking to the council offices, leaving them there, turning our backs on them and walking away, literally dumping our children, coming back home, locking the door, and when the council come and ring the doorbell to say, with you've your got, boys. With your boys, so you've got to take your children back, you don't answer the door. I couldn't do that. I just couldn't do that. And we've been, we were advised by several people pr who, have, who run care homes and have been through the professional mill that this was the only way to obtain a proper level of care. Shall we see what we can find? I think every parent becomes a warrior for their child. My love of them has never been in doubt. Thank God. Um, I mean, I'd die for them tomorrow. What for your day? Come on. I did feel the children were a gift, and I've always felt that. They've enriched our lives just hugely and so many other people. On one hand, one hasn't had the normal parental fulfilment that a lot of people have with their children of watching them playing sports, watching them socialise, watching them develop. And Henry and Freddie have both developed, but in a very unusual way. And that Henry, although he's not communicating, he doesn't speak, you know, he makes noises, he bounces around in his chair. His capacity to communicate emotion, exactly what he wants, his exact feelings to you, are very profound. I mean, we're very seldom left in any great doubt as to exactly what Henry wants and what he's thinking. And similarly with Freddie, but they are their own people. And because of their disabilities, I don't think either of us project our own desires into them. Well done. Oh, very good. That's a good one too. Well done, Freddie. Scott. Well done, very clever. Okay. Look, mummy's, mummy's gone out to sea. No, she's gone right out to sea. Ever? Should we count how many we've got? One, two, three, four, five. Five cockles, that's right. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> Sesame Street. One, two, three, four, five. Five. Five beautiful cockles. <laughs> <laughs> As much as a move to Cornwall could solve some of their problems, Henrietta and Michael know it's an impossible option. They once tried, but Cornwall would never allow them the support they need. Now the Spinks are facing the most difficult decision of their lives. We thought, well, OK, we, we can sell the house, uh, pay off all our debts, but then what? There's nowhere in this country that we can go to that will accept that we've got two disabled children with very, very high needs. I mean first comment that Cornwall made when we arrived here was, oh, you're the highest maintenance family in the county. So we didn't really know what to do um, with ourselves in selling the house, and um, there wasn't going to be enough money left over to um, really establish ourselves anywhere, and if we still couldn't work, it was just going to start all over again. So we thought, OK, what's something else that we could do? We've always passionately longed for a boat. And then suddenly we thought, you know, why don't we actually do this? Why don't we, with the rest of the money, why don't we take a boat and why don't we go around the world and just breathe? We're drowning on land. Why not float on the sea? 
and I feel very afraid and very frightened and there's still a really sort of little bourgeois bit of me that I would love to be Mrs 2.4 in Surrey but that ain't gonna happen so it's time to stop crying pull up your socks and get on with it and actually who knows where it's going to lead us and the idea is to get a boat that's large enough to live on 12 months of the year with the family and with the carers and be able to then sail from here in Cornwall and go down to the Mediterranean and then uh, around the world so we'd do a season in the Med and then hopefully go across the Caribbean which sounds wonderfully exotic but it's trying to make something really positive and exciting out of a situation that actually is non-tenable which is a, the situation in London where we cannot continue because I can't work, um, the boys are in a nice school but Henry's about to have to change school and it's getting to a point where we need to make some big changes. A sea voyage around the world would be daunting for any family. For the Sphinx, it requires meticulous planning and care. Are we going to put a car seat on each side? Yes, yeah, so it will have straps. So do you think bog standard disabled car seat? Or do you think a something plastic smaller? thing with not with steel fittings. Mm -hmm. And then with aluminium. with Freddie, just lap strap. No, Freddie lap straps. Yeah. Okay, but either side. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then are we going to use the um, boom to hoist the children down? Yeah. You see, if we've got the boom, then as a sort of um, gantry. I must admit, I wish there was just a slightly more um, easy way of getting them down below, but perhaps hoist is the easiest. Hoist is the easiest. Yeah. Amazing. It's not that we're moving from something solid into something completely wild and crazy. We're moving from something that's completely untenable and unsupportable and disastrous, which is our present lifestyle, into something which is actually adventurous and positive. So it's, it's actually a leap of faith and a positive leap, as opposed to crazy burning of bridges and throwing everything overboard. Henrietta and Michael have passed the point of no return. They have accepted an offer on the Wandsworth house and committed themselves to buying the boat. Yeah. But before embarking really upon a new cool life at really sea, nice. they must first organise the adaptation of their 50-foot yacht to accommodate Henry and Freddie's needs. Um, the um, car rally. Yeah, perfect. Yes. And we can fit those. Um, and secure those down here perfectly, right. very easily. I mean, I think that when we're actually on board with the boys, if we come back in a couple of weeks, yeah. when Freddie actually walks around, he will naturally place his hand where he wishes a grab rail. Yes. He'll be looking, and, yes. and then we'll say, okay, fine, we'll put a little grab rail there. Um, I think that's sort of one key thing, the loo, because Henry rocks and we can't risk him rocking the loo off its okay. hinges. Okay. Basically, the, the, the strength, his strength is enormous. Yeah. Henry has the capacity to rip the bolts out. You know this old-fashioned, freestanding free thing? Like a commode. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Just the guess. Adapting the boat to suit the boys will also require making room for 700 litres of water, two extra carers, really hundreds side. of nappies, and a specially designed washing machine for the continual change of clothing. Oh my God, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm going to write my next book there. Right. It's going to be called Against the Mast. Or perhaps it should be up the pole. <laughs> A lot of people said to me, so what, what happens after? And that did throw me into complete hysterics for a while, because I thought, I'm just being so insane. You know, it's so irresponsible. But then I sat back and I thought, but what now? So we're going, and I'm sure a miracle will happen upon the way. With America at the moment, it's a waiting game. Um, I think what we didn't realise right at the start was quite how much on the cutting edge of this project we were. But it, it's a waiting game. It's moving forward, but at a pace that is very difficult to predict. Wow. That is amazing. You are at the Henny? Yeah. I mean, the American trip was, was a huge amount emotionally to come to terms with. Anyway, in, in the organization of it and fundraising for it and everything. And then swapping our lives for a boat, you know, packing up the house in the next three weeks. <coughs> um, it, it's a lot. It's a lot to contend with emotionally, but now that we're back, I sort of feel okay. Been to America, got to emotionally box that now and wait for the results and just clinically deal with that. And now I've got to sort of clinically deal with the house move, and it's, it is quite difficult sort of keeping your emotions boxed. I'm sort of scared that if I start to weep, I won't stop. <laughs> With the house sold, all the family's possessions are going into storage. Um, oh, I'd love a coffee, please. 
Although leaving England, they continue their legal battle on means testing for disabled children. Though too late to help the Spinks, the outcome will decide on a fairer assessment for the 120,000 severely disabled children in Britain today. If Henry and Freddie's landmark case is won, in future it will be the disabled child who is assessed, not the parents. Every day I wondered if I was going to be planning my son's funeral. Do you think anybody cared? My life became not worth living. I do not in fact know how I survived. I've learned not to be afraid to stand up and make a noise and to challenge everything. I can truly say that my children have made me a warrior. I had never had any intention really of listening to them again. And I burnt them. And it was like burning a box of bad memories. It was very cathartic. I, that took me by surprise. It was good. Right thing to have done. So I don't regret that at all. I think when we actually get on the boat and drink that first bottle of wine, I'll say this is truly time to let go of the past. That, that will be an extraordinary moment to really say we're there, we've done it, we're free. The Spinks are currently off the coast of Italy. Freddie is showing improvements on his new medication and scientists from eight universities in America have joined Dr. Jim Fallon in attempting to find an awakening for Henry. If I'd been given the choice at the beginning, would I have taken this journey on? Probably not. But I wasn't given the choice. Instead, I was given two extraordinary, marvelous, and unique sons who would teach me that dreams, however outrageous, impossible, and far-fetched, can and do come true. 